All right, we got the green light. Hey. That's wrong. I think so. Mayor, so the lectern mic is working. Once we get the council discussion, we should be able to get these back on. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and get going. Yes, sir. Okay, so I can get going. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present the uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, Council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the report of the Military Economic Development Advisory Committee, also known as the MEDAC. I'm Fenton Priest, and it is an honor and privilege. Hi, Linwood. Honor and privilege for me to serve as chair of this uh, committee. Um, and I'm really excited. I've got some support today. So if I have any issues with my briefing, I know I've got folks that can step in and, and help me. Former Chairman uh, Dick Dunlevy, Admiral Dick Dunlevy, Phil Olson. Also have with us uh, General Fran Wilson, and also. Uh, former SEAL Commodore uh, Bob Reeve, so from the committee. So thank you very much for joining me today. And like I said, feel free to jump in if you think I'm struggling a little bit on this. <laughs> also, Steve Herbert's here, uh, have, um, and Kit, Ch well, and our newest member, Kit Chope, has joined us. So thank you, Kit, for being here. Uh, Steve Herbert's here, Charles <coughs> Norman, uh, also members of the committee, and Joe Strange, from the Development Authority. So thank you very, very much for being here for part of this briefing. Um, it is really, uh, like I said, an honor and privilege for me to serve as a chairman of this group. I, a little bit about me, I'm a local guy. I went to Cox High School. Go, go Falcons. Yeah. <laughs> and I went on Navy ROTC scholarship up to UVA, uh, joined, the, joined the Navy. <laughs> That's two strikes already. <laughs> Join the Navy with the idea that, uh, you know, I'd fulfill my scholarship obligation and then maybe move on to bigger and better things. And, uh, and then as it turned out, I kind of liked what I was doing. And about 33 years later, I got a letter from the Navy saying it's time for you to go home. <laughs> You've uh, you got to make room for a younger guy. So uh, like I tell, used to tell my kids, I said that was kind of along the way. I got picked, got selected for flag rank. And I said, this is kind of... Uh, example of how miracles can happen and maybe God's got a bigger plan for you than you have for yourself. So I uh, was very blessed to have that experience uh, and to retire as a Rear Admiral in the Navy. And that was in October 2007. And then shortly thereafter in 2008, um, I was asked to join the MEDAC. So in the beginning, if I can, in the beginning, <laughs> MEDAC was formed in uh, March of 2008, a resolution requested by uh, Vice Mayor Lewis Jones. Uh, and it was as a result uh, from the BRAC, the Base Realignment and Closure uh, Commission uh, process uh, in 2005, that really highlighted and brought to light, I guess, that there were some major issues uh, between the city and the Navy leaders in the area. And these were things that you know, I guess we're maybe not that well known until the BRAC, the BRAC process. And the city, uh, you know, really took a strong action to try to, to improve the relationships that, that seemed to have broken down over the years and started a number of tangible things that I'll talk about in a later slide. But I guess the bottom line up front that MEDAC was one of the actions taken uh, to help strengthen our relationship, the city's relationship with Navy leaders and the military community in Hampton Roads. And I'm here to say the, the good news, the takeaway is that I think here we are about 15 years later and really things are very, very good in the re in area of relationship with the Navy that we've had um, a real partnership in many, many initiatives. And again, some of those I'll talk about uh, later. But the purpose of the committee from the very beginning was to work cooperatively with the Department of Economic Development, City of Virginia Beach, uh, to support and strengthen the city-navy relations. So again, uh, starting from 2008, as directed by the City Council res resolution, uh, we, were, we were tasked to, to perform outreach to Navy uh, and other military commands to look for and support um, and give advice and counsel on economic development opportunities that affect the military community to, to assist in any way possible with uh, workforce development and helping to uh, keep exiting military uh, with their 
with their superb talent and work ethic uh, in the Virginia Beach area, and then support other Virginia Beach military affair efforts. We have a, a, a committee of 18 members. They can be senior military officers, senior enlisted personnel, or qualified civilians. As you can see, uh, what we have here is mostly senior military officers. Uh, a number of these, I guess six of us, about a third of this committee actually have been serving since uh, 2008, so since the beginning. So we're all coming up on our third five-year term, and uh, according to the clerk's office and our bylaws, uh, 15 years is our term limit. <laughs> for uh, So we have a number of us that are going to be rotating out, and we are really excited to have someone like Kit on board. We're looking for newer members, people that are more recently retired maybe. Um, Again, what we, what we, you know, when I joined, again, I retired in 07, I joined MEDAC in 08. We are looking for folks like that. If you know military folks or people that meet this criteria, you know, we are definitely interested in, in uh, filling our ranks over 2023 as, we, as many of us are, uh, start to rotate out. We've also had some other, um, some other uh, vacancies. Uh, many of you probably know Craig Quigley, Admiral Quigley moved on. Um, so we've filled his position. In fact, that's the one that Kit is filling. So we're, um, we do have, um, you know, again, some new folks we're looking to come on and support us. Do want to welcome Rocky Holcomb, council member. We're really excited to have you come on board and be part of our, part of our team. Uh, we also, you know, invite you to come. We meet the four, most Mondays, most the last Monday of most months, uh, where we generally have a monthly meeting schedule, and Mayor Dyer has visited us a few times. We certainly appreciate that, Mayor. Uh, former Mayor Will Sessom stopped in at our last meeting to kind of give us a little update of some of his concerns about the military community. We are always open to having new folks uh, join us and, and uh, tell us maybe what's on their mind, particularly as it pertains to our military community. It is you know, important to realize that, you know, we have such a large concentration of military folks, over 89,000 active duty in the city that makes us uh, probably maybe, if not the, not the largest, one of the largest active duty military populations in the country. Um, also, we have over 14,000 leaving the, the active service uh, every year. So it's more than a thousand a month of our um, of these active duty military members that are transitioning into a civilian career, and we like them to stay here if we can keep them here. So again, that's one of our focus areas. Let's see you next slide. So again, looking at the uh, at some accomplishments and where we do generally spend our time, it has been uh, looking at again our economic development opportunities. Um, Support and engagement with the Oceana's future base design process has been, uh, you know, one of the things we have formally endorsed uh, with a letter uh, in providing that endorsement. Uh, I, I attended the, uh, the industry day back in April of 2022, really a tremendous event. I think uh, many, many positive comments and uh, I thought a uh, great, great initiative. Uh, again, we the, our letter supported the non-binding resolution, and we, we just think that this is a, a clear win-win for the city and for the Navy as, a, um, as an opportunity for economic development and uh, support to, our, to, our, to NAS Oceana. The Skill Bridge program is a, is a relatively new thing that we, that we were, were learning about. City of Norfolk has started working uh, with it. We, uh, we, we signed out a letter uh, asking Virginia Beach to really to try to initiate that new program, um, it is something that um, that gives us and it gives the city an opportunity to bring in service members that are transitioning out of their active duty career and bring them on before they've actually formally separated from the from the military. It's called in Virginia called the Hire Vets Now Fellowship Program, and. And like I said, we, uh, we really endorse this as a, as a really good opportunity in the, in the area of workforce development and helping transitioning military members. Uh, some of the other things on the accomplishments, I like to highlight the uh, Jones and Cabacoy Veteran Care Center, really a great, great, uh, I would say, jewel of the city of Virginia Beach now to help veterans uh, that need that type of care. Um, and uh, we, we were uh, all, we've been engaged in supporting that. 
Uh, and then we did start formal meetings with the Norfolk MEDAC. So again, Virginia Beach led the way with the MEDAC in 2008. Uh, sometime later, City of Norfolk put together a MEDAC. I think they saw the success that we were having. And I will say, you know, again, kudos to Virginia Beach for starting it. Norfolk followed. And we, uh, we now meet with them periodically. Our meeting in September this month will be a joint meeting at the Slover Library uh, with the Norfolk MEDAC. And one of the benefits of bringing both of us together uh, is that that way when people like uh, Secretary Crenshaw come in from the governor's office, he can see a more regional picture of what's, uh, of what's going on in the military economic development area. So, so we have, again, started those and consider that to be a, a good initiative going forward. Um, also, I mentioned in the outreach area, uh, we do command briefings, what we call, uh, uh, that's an outreach to go out to the different commands, mostly, of course, Oceana, uh, JEB, Little Creek Fort Story. We talk to this commanding officers, executive officers, command master chiefs, um, those that uh, really have their kind of finger on the pulse of what's going on, of course, within the within the military community, but then also particularly commanding officers uh, and, and XOs a lot of times maybe have some concerns, not really sure how to address those. We give them a way to communicate their concerns uh, to city leaders. Um, and a lot of times it can be just a matter of a communication issue that they don't know who to call or they've called and they didn't get to the right person, so they didn't really feel like they got the right answer. So we kind of intervene. We are that sort of that, sort of that communication conduit to help th help um, improve the communications between those command uh, leaders and the city leaders. So we we went out to uh, Little Creek and Fort Story, met with Captain Mike Witherspoon, his XO out there. Went out to Oceana, um, and of course had met with uh, Captain Bob Holmes, commanding officer, and his his senior staff out there. But one thing that we did do, which was kind of a, a new thing, is to, to, to even improve uh, that communication line. We asked uh, Oceana if they could come and come to our MEDAC meeting with their same senior leadership or even others, and we would make you know, the time on the agenda. To, we pretty much devote a meeting to them just talking about their concerns or what they had coming up. Of course, they were very concerned that they were excited about the air show and that's coming up this weekend. Hopefully everybody will be there. It sounds going to be exciting to see the blue angels again, but they, they did make a, an effort to come in and talk to us. And we felt really good about that, 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 about that meeting, you know, the issues of transportation and, you know, just different <coughs> things that they had that uh, we again formalized and we do record those uh, concerns and send them to the city. So, so those are, so those are some of the things that we are, uh, accomplishing in helping the communication and the relationships with the Navy and the commands and the leaders in those commands. Um, so, you know, another initiative, so initiatives that we have ongoing throughout the year is engagement with the, at the state level, with Sec Secretary Crenshaw, Secretary of, De of the Veterans and Defense Affairs, uh, Commissioner Daniel Gabe. Um, again, they've been down to visit us. Uh, we are engaging with the Hampton Roads Military and Federal Facilities Alliance, RUMFA, as a way to just really stay in, in, in touch with any possible future BRAC issues, anything that's going to affect our facilities. Uh, as I mentioned, Craig Quigley was on our MEDAC. He has moved on and retired, but, uh, uh, but his deputy, uh, Rick Dwyer, is now taken over as director. So Rick is now coming to our meetings, making his formal reports and sending us uh, updates from what the, what the folks at Harumph are dealing with. Uh, and again, we continue our command briefings as a way to continue this relationship because we wanna make sure that there's no problem with any of our senior military guys picking up a phone and calling us if they have an issue. We wanna have, we wanna continue that relationship as people change and, and, uh, and, and some of the you know, issues come up with new folks and new commands in the different commands. Um, one of the things we do talk about, we just added this slide, is just an example. When we go out to the command or they come to us, we always spend some time talking about Virginia Beach as a duty station, a place to live, work, serve, play, have fun with your families, and, uh, and a place you really do want to live once you leave active service. So one of the things that we talk about is, our, of course, our public and private education 
talk about the facilities we have here, talk about our employment opportunities, the growth uh, that's going on in the city, uh, recreational, cultural activities. So again, we are out, out there basically promoting Virginia Beach and selling Virginia Beach as a, as a way to, uh, to help our military families here feel good about staying here and really thinking that this is where they want to spend the rest of their time after military service. Um, and then talking about tangible, tangible city commitment, what the city did to, to really make our, I think this relationship work so well. Uh, in addition to the MEDAC, of course, uh, OLEC uh, was a model for the nation really of how to deal with encroachment around a naval facility. Um, so that is a, is a tremendous success story. Um, the different military, again, the re resources that are available for service members here, we talk about those things that are available. Um, uh, again, a number of other items there, public education, again, the city is just, has such a great, great school system. I went through it, sent my kids through it. I could talk from a lot of personal experience of how great it is to, to be in Virginia Beach and take advantage of a terrific public education. Uh, let's see, next. All right. Um, what we do here is we generally have, you know, there's a lot of veteran support organizations. A lot of these are doing a lot of good work. Uh, they don't always talk to each other. Sometimes there are disconnects. Uh, we, one of our efforts in helping, uh, again, veterans, helping our military community is connecting them to these different uh, resources. So, for example, the Hampton Roads Workforce Development Council, the Workforce Development uh, Board, uh, Fulton Camp, uh, is, he regularly attends our meetings. We try to connect him to the right folks in the, on the, uh, at these various bases. Um, again, we just, we support these organizations and we help them get the word out about their initiatives and what they're doing in an outreach uh, to, to the military. And they do have, you know, it's a, a lot of times a matter of just communications and helping in that effort. Uh, and then again, exiting military resources, we do provide this information and when we make the command visits, we make sure that, fo that folks in this area do know what's available and there are some substantial uh, resources available. Okay, so again, I thank you for this opportunity to provide uh, this update on the Military Economic Development Advisory Committee. Uh, you know, I, I really do, again, invite you to join us sometime if you'd like to, to kind of see what we do up close and personal. I do want to thank all those that serve on, uh, serve, that have helped support us that are here today. And um, subject to your questions, this would conclude my update. Great, Admiral, thank you. Any questions or con, uh, concerns or any comments for the end? Yeah, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have one question. First, thank you for your support and your service to our country, all of you men and women are, that are here today who, who have served. Um, my question is, so my wife is a professor at Kiowa Community College, and so she helps a lot of our military and their family and veterans transition to civilian life. Yes. One of the things we have talked about was transferable skills. A lot of times our military already come with these great skills and so trying to lessen the financial burden, number one, from finding a four-year school or two-year school like community college, um, but also using those skills, get it, getting them credit for the skills that they already possess. Mm -hmm. That's something that you all are looking at or honing in on, especially from a, a workforce um, council development. Yeah, well, certainly that, yeah, we do, we do, when we bring in, let's say, Salt and Camp from um, from the Workforce Council, you know they do really look at that type of counseling. And you know, when I look at, the, I mean, we do have TCC on here as one of our resources, the uh, Center for Military and Veterans Education. But yes, you're right that when there's certificate programs that really do help document the uh, the skill levels of service members without getting a degree. But yes, we do recognize that as a challenge and service members do have considerable skills that, that may not be obvious when you look at their military background, but whether it's organizational, of course, work ethic, uh, management, crisis management, uh, uh, even if they're, you know, like a SEAL team um, guy that I used to, I was involved for a while with the Honor Foundation that helped SEAL team members transition. I'm sure Bob could talk to this, but uh, they would say, 
more 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 stressful than going on an op on an operation would be you know going before a uh, you know a, a hiring committee and explaining what I did you know if you're a sniper or you know how does that relate you know jump out of planes but how does that relate to this job that I'm trying to get so no it, it's you know it, 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 it and, and the one of the honor foundation you know the honor foundation is one of the local organizations that really is helping uh, special forces folks make that transition and translate their resumes and their skill set into civilian jobs. But again, what you point out is, is, is a great, you know, issue and problem. And it's important to connect those folks to the right people. The Honor Foundation really just works with uh, the special ops community, but there are others. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? The Honor Foundation is actually at TCC and it was established. And they pull people in. They sign up for the commitment. The Honor Foundation is actually funded by the SEAL Foundation. And they make arrangements with a variety of CEOs and companies and arrange interviews with them. So once they sign up for that program, they're committed to it, the chances are they're going to end up with a job with a large company. So I wonder, is there something from a um, policy or accreditation standpoint to where it would take two years or maybe three years for them to get a, a certain accreditation that we can lessen that mm -hmm. they already possess those 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 skills and so um, mr adams is coming up i don't know if i can grab that one yes please yes please Councilmember, thank you so much for the question this is um it's important to note that the that medac partnered with the workforce council is engaged in this issue exactly through the skill bridge program that this that this council participates in so yes sir that act that uh that work is underway and uh, and we're working through it as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Right. Adams. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, my last question. I'm doing some uh, research and development and I was recently watching um, this movie, you may have heard of it, Top Gun 2. <laughs> so um, inquiry minds want to know, can an F-14 take off on a taxiway with his wings fully extended? <laughs> well, we might have a couple of guys here. Let's see, uh, Admiral Dunleavy so, so or uh, I'm I'm Joe, but uh, there might be. Uh, Is that realistic? So I guess we have to do some more research on that. Okay, all right. I will tell you, as a sailor, you can't launch a spinnaker the way uh, Tom Cruise did on that sailboat. Yeah, I was, I was, I was <laughs> in that of wind, I can tell you that I don't know that that's ever been done either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bro. All right. Uh, okay. Okay, John and Del Sena. I just want to mention all ratings in the Navy are cross-referenced on their task to the Department of Labor skill sets that translate to commercial. Things that's and they a lot of certifications are granted from that. There already is a policy. There's a Navy command that does all that analysis, does that in with the Department of Labor for technical skills. Uh, so that is out there, so people know that they have that and they can get that certification and go and work and uh, things that we are very much in short supply of today. Uh, but there is a crosswalk between the Department of Labor commercial and the task list of stuff that go with Navy ratings and at pay grade level. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I really, first, and I do want to appreciate all your, uh, all your support to our MEDAC. Thank you, Councilman Moss. It's been uh, great to have you as part of our committee. But uh, yes, and, and, and one of the things you do here, and we see it again with all these resources, that there's still, you know, a real need to try to connect folks to, you know, where if they have that issue, how do you connect them to the right source? And it can get very frustrating because you can hit a lot of dead ends by not knowing kind of where to go. And at some point you give up. <laughs> so we are trying to help in that regard by giving folks. And actually, that's one thing uh, Mayor Sesum said. He goes, I want to have that one number that I could call to kind of resolve this issue. And we're like, well, <laughs> we're not there yet. And, you know, we'd love to give you that one number, whatever it might be, or that one website where you could find all the answers. But uh, there are people working on that. Uh, but, you know, we're not there yet. Yes, I'm sorry. I'll say no. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I know we read a lot about the challenges with mental health and those who have been victims of sexual assault and other issues. And I want to make sure that all of our those who serve have the opportunity to heal 
And as they enter the workforce and make that transition, are you all involved in that space at all? You know, we have not, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, we have not really taken on that particular, I mean, as part of the transitioning process, mm -hmm. as part of connecting them to other resources, there are resources that offer those type of services in our list of, of many you know, military uh, resources. But as far as the actual, uh, you know, we have not um, taken any formal action in support of any type of program like that, but we certainly su support those type of programs. We're, we're what we want what's in best in the best interest of our military community and those serving. So we certainly have, and, and I would say maybe we take that as, as a good suggestion and maybe we could look specifically at that area uh, as something, you know, in addition to what we've been working on as far as the workforce piece. But, uh, you know, I appreciate that comment and I think, uh, you know, that is a, it's something that we would, you know, we could certainly look into. So I would say maybe, uh, Steve, Charlie, we could add that as one of, our, one of our concerns and one of our focus areas going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? Um, well, yeah, Sharon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my last question would be about as far as environmental concerns and economic development of the military. Are you all looking at that? Is that a discussion that comes up in media, um, particularly when it comes around flooding in, in Hampton Roads in our city, as well as our neighboring cities, uh, community Norfolk? Well, you know, I would say probably more in line with, let's say, you know, issues with now f uh, future based design and Oceana developing the the. Uh, Areas around there, I'm sure those kind of environmental concerns are are clearly, you know, being addressed and have to be addressed as they look to the opportunities for those different land use, uh, um, you know, uh, program or uh, land use possibilities. But uh, so, you know, we are we certainly we listen to those when we go out on our command briefings. If we hear those type of issues, if they have an issue, they want us the city to take a look at We're definitely a conduit to help look at that. So, yeah, thank you. Right, thank you. Hey, anyone else? You know, Admiral, I just want to thank you and your uh, tremendous group of folks that you're associated with. But I'll tell you what, I think Virginia Beach takes a lot of pride with our relationship that we have with the military community. Admiral Rock, in his uh, you know farewell speech, was very complimentary about the relationship with Virginia Beach. As a matter of fact, he conveyed to the manager and myself that he had every command between here in Chicago and Virginia Beach was by far the you know, easiest city to deal with uh, in terms of congeniality and uh, you know just working relationships that we've had. Uh, you know, you know. Let me put it this way: I was just on council when we got put on the brick uh, list, and it was definitely a wake-up call. And I'm proud to say, and you know, get chokes here, that you know, since then we've had a seamless continuum of excellence with communication, you know, with the CEOs of Oceana and you know the uh, the staff. Uh, recently, uh, the manager and I, we uh, we were at the change of command where Admiral Gray took over, and he hosted us for a very uh, good dinner with you know the manager and you know Taylor and. I went to a Marine Corps uh, chain of command. And the overwhelming thing we're hearing is that how welcome the military and their families are made to feel right here in Virginia Beach. You know, they are the DNA of, you know, what we're about. And I do have a little bit of a running co uh, commentary with our dear friend, uh, Mayor Alexander, where I say, uh, yeah, you got NATO in Norfolk, but they all live here. <laughs> um, and uh, but but once again, when you think about all the different organizations we have that truly and honestly complement each other, uh, you know, you know, the manager, uh, you know, we conduct meetings periodically to you know with uh, Oceana and Little Creek. You know, you know, to work on joint problems. How could we do this together? How could we do things, you know, cooperatively, and, you know, in a very, very positive way? And, you know, just, you know, keep this feeling of positivity together. And, you know, and, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, former Marine Corporal and uh, Aaron, the aircraft I worked on are hanging from wires and music, <laughs> uh, the old Phantom and, and everything. But, 
you know, what a privilege it is to be among you. And, uh, you know, recently I was uh, appointed vice chair of uh, Harumpha, too. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's our military community, as I said, are very, very much a part of us. And, you know, you do encourage it. Get out to the air show. See what's here. See, and I'll tell you what, it, 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 it's mind-blowing. And, you know, the fact is that, you know, Fridays they bring the STEM students in and, you know, it, the base is open to thousands upon thousands of people. And to let people know that it's your base too. And uh, but I tell you what, you know, I don't think we can uh, speak highly enough. But the other thing is, let's not underscore the fact that you are an essential ingredient to the national defense of our country. And, uh, you, you know, but once again, those who have, who currently serve and who have served and everything, uh, you know, a heartfelt thank you for so many of us. Well, thank you. And, and I do thank you for, and, and all the council for, you know, really the service that you, uh, that you have for this city, the love for this city. I, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, when you go out and you talk to the military commands, you, it's easy to kind of sell again, talk about what a great place Virginia Beach is. And that's in large measure because we have such a great city council that, that really, really serves this community and the city. And as again, as a, as a lifetime resident, I, I sincerely appreciate what's happened since 2005. And I'm just glad to, again, to be uh, supporting this, uh, this initiative with our relationships with the Navy. But again, thank you for what you do for this city. It's, it's really been, it's, it's, such, it's, so, it's been so successful. I honestly think whether it was OLEC or, you know, now what's happened with MEDAX, you know, we've, we've kind of set a standard that uh, it's really people around the country have noticed. I know people used to often talk about it, how this area was recognized for the relationships that we have with our military. And uh, so again, thank you for what you do. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. DeHandy, you have a few uh, briefings for us. Mr. Mayor, at this time, Dr. Caleb Padati, our um, Virginia Beach Health District Director, is going to come and give council a quarterly update as it relates to public health in Virginia Beach. so much. So I don't have any slides for you all today. I thought what I would do is just talk to our top of mind as we start to move into the fall for public health. So those three topics are going to be uh, COVID, flu, and monkeypox. But certainly as I move along, if there are questions or things that I can clarify or anything additional you need, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt. So starting with COVID, um, right now, as I'm sure you're all well aware, our COVID virus activity level here in Virginia Beach is low. And that's a good thing, although as I'm sure you all remember, in the past couple of years, we've really seen the virus activity for COVID go up and down at different points throughout the response. And so what I can tell you is that from a public health and epidemiologic perspective, um, we're increasingly seeing COVID a seasonal respiratory virus pattern. And that makes sense because that's similar to the other viruses in the coronavirus family. It's similar to how we know this virus is transmitted from one person to another by respiratory secretions. So I mention that now because I think that, again, it's great that virus activity is low right now, but I do think it's likely that we'll see an increase in the fall and winter months as it starts to look more like some of those other respiratory illnesses. So that means that when we're in close proximity to each other, right, indoors, it's colder weather, there's more opportunities for respiratory viruses like COVID to spread. Um, and that is exactly why now is the perfect time to take advantage of those COVID vaccines. So I'm sure you all have heard um, very recently that there has been an updated COVID vaccine that has become available. And this vaccine for this season is actually targeting um, the BA4 and BA5 subvariants of the Omicron strain that have been circulating more recently and so therefore are responsible for more of the more recent virus activity. So that makes a lot of sense, right? And that probably sounds like some other viruses that we'll talk about in a minute here, flu, right? In terms of updating a vaccine to better reflect what's circulating. 
So that vaccine that I just, just mentioned, um, there's two of them um, through Moderna and Pfizer. Um, they are both issued in <coughs> UA. They've both been approved by the ACIP or Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and CDC. And they're both available now in Virginia and of course here in Virginia Beach. Um, so we have already started offering those boosters. And the recommendation now is that anybody 12 years and older receive that updated strain booster if it's been at least two months since they completed a primary series or a booster. So again, I know there've been a lot of evolutions in how we've offered vaccine over time, but to be clear, this updated recommendation is for the new uh, vaccine that better addresses the circulating strains. And the recommendation is that everybody who has had a primary series at least two months ago or a booster who is 12 years and older take advantage of that. And again, you can do that here in Virginia Beach. Um, and probably the easiest way is by going to vaccinate.virginia.gov or to our Virginia Beach Health Department website. And you'll find a link there where you can click on it and find the appointments and availability near you. And again, that vaccine, that updated vaccine against those circulating strains is gonna be incredibly important to help us keep virus activity low for the fall and winter and help protect those among us who are most vulnerable and most at risk of bad outcomes. Sure. Sorry. Can you repeat the website again, please? Yeah, vaccinate.virginia.gov. Okay. You can also go to VASE, V-A-S-E, dot vdh dot virginia dot gov although i know that one's a little bit more complicated i apologize um, but those links are available just through the virginia beach department of public health website um, and you can click on them and sign up for an appointment Thank you. Yeah, absolutely any other questions about covid good to go okay we can move to influenza so um, again, I mentioned um, certainly not the same virus by any means, but I'm sure you're starting to see some similarities between the public health and medical approach to flu and COVID. And that's because we're in a better place than we were two years ago. We've got more tools. Um, but as we all know, just like COVID is still a serious illness, flu is still very much a serious virus that unfortunately circulates in our communities every year and unfortunately can cause serious illness and even death in people every year. Um, again, which is why now is a great time to take advantage of the preventive tools that we have available, and that is vaccine. So um, again, you'll start to see in your communities, and you know, we would encourage everybody, whether it's your doctor's office, pharmacies, public health, or any place that's easy for you, um, to take advantage of that flu vaccine. That's going to go a long way to helping protect yourself and your family, um, particularly because we do know that there were some signals from the Southern Hemisphere season that there was some pretty strong flu virus activity. So we would really encourage everybody to take advantage of that flu vaccine as well. Um, and ideally, you know, often we get asked about ideal timing for that. Um, ideally, somewhere around October is generally when we say that's a good time to plan to get your flu shot. And we say that because just like learning anything else, it takes your immune system a little bit of time to learn to fight something. So you want to give it about two to four weeks before it would have to fight that virus off. And so again, we say somewhere around October would be ideal. So for anybody who is not yet thinking about it, you know, start looking out for where you might be able to access flu vaccine near you um, and planning for getting that vaccine here in the next month or so. Any questions about Any questions on that? Well, you're doing good. That's great. And so that means we're all going to get our vaccines. I am very excited. Um, we can keep moving along. Um, so um, the last topic that I wanted to cover for you all this afternoon is monkeypox. So I think the last time I was here with you all was back in June, and we were just starting to talk about um, this reemergence of this virus. Um, again, a member of the orthopox virus family that is not new, but has definitely reemerged globally um, in a new way. And so, of course, over the past several months, what we've seen is an increase, unfortunately, in those cases globally, over 57,000. Um, in the United States, over 21,000. And here in the state of Virginia, we're at 409 with 21 of those cases uh, in Virginia Beach. So this virus, again, um, is one that moves between us with close skin-to-skin -skin contact and can cause rash, fever, um, and some swollen lymph nodes. Now, when people are diagnosed with this illness, this is again an example of the kind of illness that public health gets notified about and that we follow up on. And we do that really for two reasons. 
One is we want to better understand how we can support affected individuals and how they may have been exposed. But the other is because we want to reach out to anybody who may have had close contact with that individual, regardless of who they are or what the contact is, because we can offer them vaccine. So we do have an FDA-approved vaccine against monkeypox that can lower the likelihood that somebody who's been exposed will then go on to develop monkeypox. And so that's the group that we've been targeting with vaccines. So that's people who have had an exposure or who are more likely to have had an exposure. And so as we've seen vaccine supply expand, you've seen us um, expand our offerings of this vaccine here over the past several months. And the Virginia Beach Health Department has offered over 2,600 monkeypox shots over the past several months. And we continue to make that available for our community. And you can access that again through those same links that I mentioned. So directing people to check that web page and visit that link um, is a way that you can make sure that you can make that appointment. Um, it'll ask you a couple of questions and then you can go ahead and, and take advantage of that preventive tool. Now again, the overall risk for our community for monkeypox is low, but there are some people who are at greater risk. And those are the groups that we really wanna make sure we're supporting with this, making sure that we're offering them that preventive tool and keeping everybody up to date and informed on what's going on. And so I think that concludes my remarks on monkeypox. Hey, anybody, Michael. Good afternoon, Dr. Padati. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. I have a follow-up question about um, some of your comments about monkeypox. First, I just want to thank you for being here and, and thank you for sharing that information and for the really remarkable work that you and your team have done to address that concern, as well as the others that you addressed in our community. Um, I think one of the reasons that you and I have, that I reached out to you uh, many months ago and that we've been in communication since then is because historically, um, diseases that have impacted LGBTQ plus have been um, under, um, under uh, resourced. The responses have been under resourced. They've been unremarkable and, um, and they've been uh, unfortunately um, unfair to members of our community who are different. And so um, it's my goal and I think, I know, I know you share it and the manager shares it to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that position with this particular situation, and I don't think we have. There's a lot of uncertainty around monkeypox and who should be vaccinated, what it is, how do you catch it, and I think the um, public relations efforts that you have made, as well as the strategic outreach efforts, have made a real difference in our community and about raising awareness and, and lowering the risk for people, so I very much appreciate that. Um, I want to ask you uh, about a little bit about the sort of state's coordination in Hampton Roads, because I've noticed that the Virginia Beach Department of Health, your agency, has taken a lead regionally. And um, people I know who live in Norfolk, who live in other areas, are looking to Virginia Beach for access to the vaccine or for information. And is that a coordinated effort? I'm just wondering if you could share with me why that is. I'm happy for it. I have no, there's no regional uh, competition here. But I, I'm just curious what that's about. and if you could provide some insight there. Absolutely. So, of course, you know, we are one of the 35 uh, districts that belong to VDH and make up the different community health districts across the state, right? And so we work in very close collaboration um, with the state and with our neighbors. And I think it's actually a really great example of a place where um, we may be differently resourced and we may have different yes. needs at different times, right? And so when this arose as a public health concern, there was absolutely no hesitation. You know, I can tell you about collaborating with our neighbors and making sure that if there was anybody who we needed to support in our community, we were doing that. Um, and I can tell you that's the same approach that we would take to any other public health issue. It just says, just more specifically, so if there's a the Norfolk Department of Public Health, do they, are they offering vaccines? Yeah, so... Each different health department has kind of come up with a different um, plan based on their resources and capabilities for how to administer and share and sign people up. You've probably seen or maybe heard about different approaches from different districts really across the state of Virginia. And again, we really do try to coordinate because we're all a part of VDH and be as consistent as we can, um, both to maximize effectiveness and also to make things as clear for people as possible, right? So that you're not having to figure out a new system when you move from one place to another. 
Um, but yes, you know, Norfolk offers um, some vaccine. There are other health departments. And again, I, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of them since I don't know all of their intricate details, but, um, you know, other districts are certainly offering vaccine, um, but you're absolutely right. In Virginia Beach, we have made it a point to make sure that we are doing absolutely everything we can to support um, our community, which includes people who may be visiting Virginia Beach, um, you know, or, or regionally participating in our activities or other things. I appreciate that very much. I mean, not to belabor the point, but, it, you know, the, the memory of the AIDS crisis lives fresh in many people's minds. And many people suffered and died. I hope that people aren't dying as a result of this disease, but suffer because of who they are and because the government was slow to respond. And so it's a priority of mine to make sure that people don't have to live through that again to the extent that um, that I can influence that. I take that responsibility very seriously. And I think the work that you and your team are doing is really um, in the city of Virginia Beach, and I know Ms. Ms. Russell is here, and she's worked on this, and Mr. Johaney are all working together to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that situation again. And that's a, I think that's a bright spot, and it's very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Elsino, and then uh, Samara. Really, just sort of a segue from that. Again, thank you for all your hard work. Um, you, I know we say we always mention the term <laughs> vulnerable communities. Really want to give you this opportunity. Um, to share with the public your efforts with the outreach to reach those and how you define them, whether it's homeless, whether it's those who are low income or minority or, or others that may not have access to this website. All of those. You so are just give you an opportunity to share with the public the, the efforts that you go through to make sure we reach those who are a little tougher to reach. Thank you. And you are absolutely right. And I would say it includes all of those groups. Um, and I would also say that sometimes there are vulnerabilities that aren't as apparent as others, and there are vulnerabilities that are experienced differently depending on the health concern we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you're absolutely right, you know, making sure that we're proactively reaching out to the groups who are being most impacted, regardless of who they are or what they look like or where they are, right, is incredibly important. And it's something that I think we can do better. Um, I can tell you that I think we learned how to do things a little bit better through COVID. COVID was incredibly challenging, of course, for a lot of reasons, but it taught us that public health can really serve as a good bridge between the community and healthcare, right? And it's exactly through what you just mentioned, that really proactive, hands-on, talking to somebody kind of outreach. Um, and for monkeypox, for example, I can tell you that a lot of that early outreach was done through phone calls, by visiting people in their communities, by you know going in person, right, to have conversations about a topic that may be sensitive and that for many may you know mirror uh, challenging experiences of decades past. Um, but I will tell you that there are always opportunities for us to do that better, and that is absolutely a priority of the health department. I stand with uh, Councilman um, Perlucci, the same thing to to reach those who are a little bit tougher, where technology is not the first mode of communication, whether they're elderly or uh, ESL, English is second language, any of those would be happy to step up and help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, hey, Sabrina. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for the update. I also want to thank you, because I didn't get a chance to follow up with you. There was a young man who contacted me, and he was trying to get the monkeypox uh, vaccination, and so you were very prompt at addressing his concern, and you um, uh, supported him and helped him through what he was going through. So thank you for doing that. Um, he was, you know, a bit concerned, and it's always good to reach out to uh, individuals, reach out to staff and others, and they address it right away. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, if I could. Um, that is just a great reflection of the incredible team that we have at the department. So I so appreciate that you made that connection, um, but it's really a credit to them, not to me. Thank you. I appreciate you doing that. It is, it, it is good to have a good team with you <coughs> for what you do and the team as well. I want to ask about, um, and you probably may be aware, about correspondence that um, I received, and I'm sure other members of the body received as well, pertaining to, um, it's the National Initiative to Address COVID-19 
health disparities among populations at high risk and, uh, and the underserved. And so a letter was sent out uh, yesterday uh, by a gentleman by the name of William Tyree, who is um, a faith-based leader. It was signed the Faith-Based Community Leaders of Hampton Road. So there are other individuals who are included. Um, I know in the very beginning, when you talked about um, working with Kate Meacham and um, this initiative and reaching out to um, the community. And uh, I remember talking about how I would be supportive and help. And I did, you know, talk with both of you all. And it was a, a very good meeting. Um, and the other day I was thinking about following up with you. Um, so this letter sparked that follow up. Um, I would also say what also caught my attention is um, I work with individuals who are addressing um, disparities in um, the minority and underserved communities. And so um, they are trying to make sure that they get the, uh, the attention and the support and the funding that they need. So here in this specific, um, I made a note so I make sure I get it right, this specific <clears throat> correspondence, they were asking about the follow-up uh, from Ms. Meacham meeting them and talking about the initial grant, the funding, and then specifically, they were concerned that she didn't follow up and participate in you know, outreach um, events and that, and that sort. Um, so those items were brought up. And then what really is at the helm of this issue is the funding. Um, and they are concerned if they are going to receive it because they haven't been able to do so. So um, I know I don't want to just kind of like throw all of that at you. I know it's going to take some time to kind of look that information up, maybe um, review, but I am interested in um, getting to the, the crux of the matter. Um, they have asked for an invest investigation as well. Um, and an investigation is good because it shows what's been done. Um, so if there's no issue, then we see what has been done. If it's not, if there is an issue, then we see how we can address it. Um, so I would like to, um, and I've talked with the city manager about having a, a special session to go into what's what's happened, the data, where, where did the funding go? Um, because they are concerned that if that funding is not used, it's going to roll over into a nonprofit and they won't be able to tap into those resources. So um, I guess my, my those are their, their requests. Um, I would like to see how we move forward with this. Is, this, is that through the investigation, um, perhaps, I don't know, an audit to find out where the funds went, but, but we do need to um, address this matter with data, with what's been done, so that we can take that information to them and address it. Because um, they're asking for some other things that are more, I'd say, um, you know, um, it, it would probably be, um, well, we want to see what we can do first before we talk about um, the other, um, going to the extreme of releasing people and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, and so I guess, how do we move forward with that? And how can I help? Because I told you in the beginning, I wanted to be more supportive and help. And so I do want to do that. And I do want to address their concerns. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Councilman. You know, Kate and I so appreciated the meeting we had with you and your continued offers of support. I think that's really important, not just for this, right, but for any public health topic of concern for our communities. So thank you for that. Um, absolutely. Certainly, we're always happy to sort of have a follow-up conversation. Um, as you well know from your experiences with her as well, um, Kate has been an incredible asset for the health department. We are so fortunate that we were able to have her assistance on this project. And we're actually getting close to being able to do um, an updated work plan as well as request what's called a no-cost extension through the CDC. So recall that these are federal funds that came directly to the health department from the CDC. 
Um, and they offer you an opportunity to continue the great work um, without having that deadline, which would, would have been upcoming of July 2023. So it's a great opportunity as we get that information together for us to share more about the plans for how to use that. Um, we continue to work incredibly closely with our colleagues at CDC, of course with VDH who received similar funding um, across districts for the rest of Virginia, um, and of course with other jurisdictions who have received similar funding. But I think I mentioned at our last, you know, the last time I was here, it brings up another really important piece of public health, which is infrastructure, right? So this is still a grant, um, it is still time limited. Um, and we are really excited about the work that we're gonna be able to do. But in order to sustain good work, we really need a lasting um, investment in public health infrastructure and in the kinds of things that our community needs. So I think this is actually a really great opportunity for us to talk more about that work and what those needs look like for Virginia Beach moving forward. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then I know um, Council Member Ross has um, wants to respond. But also with um, Mr. Duhaney, in terms of getting that, that data and that information, um, looking into these concerns, the best way to go about it, um, a, a, a session um, for this specific issue to get that data, to get that information out there, because it was sent to the whole body. Um, so this one, um, that'll be up to council. If council desires that, we can coordinate with Dr. Fadadi to see to what extent um, the health department wants to bring that information forward to present to council. And so if I'm requesting that it be put on the agenda, can we do that? I would request to see if Dr. Padati is able to accommodate that request. We can do so. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I'd like to do that. And then from then on, um, in terms of an investigation, which is what they're asking for, how do you go to or, or do that investigation? Would that be through an audit? How would that how would that work? Council Member Wooten, uh, funding didn't come through the city. The, fu the, fu the funding went from the federal government to the Virginia Department of Health, which then went to their sub-entity, the Virginia Beach Department of Health, Public Health. So I don't think we have jurisdiction to investigate the state. Mm -hmm. No, sir. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, how do we determine what has happened um, in terms of the community? Um, what were the steps that were taken um, here in our purview, not the state, in our purview? Um, where we, you know, where that initial meeting took place and sat down and talked with the, the community leaders, then what transpired? That's what we're looking for. That's what they're looking for. Um, and so what, what, how do we find out the update information in terms of our purview um, when it came to us, then what happened? Okay. I'll follow up with you after the fact. I'm not clear because the city does not have a grant for health equity the grants with the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health. So this, um, Dr. Badati's team would have to provide that update. And that's what I want. I think Dr. Badati said that she's amenable to that if council wants her on the agenda. Okay, um, but what I was asking separately in terms of investigating it, if that's not sufficient, then what can we do? Because, I'm, you know, because, you know, oftentimes these groups, um, and they're concerned if they don't receive the information that they want, then they go to the media and other avenues. So I would like to make sure we address this in-house before it gets to that level. So being proactive instead of reactive, um, there are things we can do to, to make sure we address that. That's my concern. Understood. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Henley and then Aaron. On the same email that she was just referring to, in looking at the uh, funds that were to come, I noticed that under underserved communities it included rural areas. And you and I had a conversation about that. I know during the first year of the uh, pandemic with the shots, I had a, a, a very hard time ever getting a couple of, and there were a couple finally, of the uh, <coughs> sessions down in the rural area, people had to come all the way up to town to get the vaccine. But since that first area, 
that first year with the boosters and everything, there hasn't been a single one in the rural area. And you and I talked about the fact that in our rural area, which is pretty extensive, uh, we don't have transportation. And many people who need services uh, not only cannot get to them because of the distance, of the, but also because of the fact that, they, that there's no public transportation. So we do need to start looking at a way to, not only because of this funding or anything, but to start remembering that there is a large community of people in the rural area who really don't have the health services. And uh, I, I hope that it won't be so difficult, but there hasn't been a single session of giving the vaccine in the last two years. Uh, of uh, in the rural area. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And that's really important to tell you. Um, part of that is because recognizing to that population, our approach has been to try and do one-on-one -on -one outreach. Um, so taking either some of our volunteers or even sometimes partnering with EMS to send people out as um, there are individuals. Who that's how I got it was the EMS. Um, and as recently as today, I can tell you our outreach team, um, which includes members of the uh, grant team under Kate, are working to do that targeted, really phone um, proactive outreach in light of the new bivalent uh, booster. So absolutely an important need. Could not agree with you more. And we're going to keep doing some of that really proactive outreach to bring the resources to people who may not otherwise have easy access to them. Thank you. Okay, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to be clear, so that I'm clear and on uh, understanding was what we're we're talking about the health equity grant, and are we is are we talking about three point three five million dollars? Yes. Okay, and so um, I believe what I'm understanding here is that will you be able to? And it seems like you you were, I guess, alluding to that. Break that down to how that is being utilized in the city of Virginia Beach. Yeah. Where you're you're going to get the information for us? I have no problem providing that information. Oh, great. So. What we've done over the course of receiving that grant, there's been about 15% of it that's been spent down, which is a relatively small amount. And if you look nationally at others who received the same award, that's actually pretty consistent. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of the big ones, though, which makes a lot of sense, the pandemic is not the same today as it was two years ago, right? And so our community's needs are a little different. And so we've had to update that plan which again is why I mentioned we'll be providing an updated work plan and uh, requesting that no cost extension to continue the work. Um, but I'm happy to give those kinds of updates. Thank you. And the last but certainly not least, in, in that letter, it was, it was highly inflammatory for one of our staff members, uh, Dr. Ken Chandler. Um, I think he serves our community very, very well. Um, this is my time on coming on council. He's done a, an excellent job. He's gone um, above and not his way to provide all the information that we need. Um, to respond um, very, very uh, uh, fast uh, in a manner to uh, to to uh, his professional his professional um, just work has just been exemplary in the way he conducts himself. And so, um, you know, again, I don't know what anyone else's experiences is, but I know Dr. Ken Chandler has has been a a great addition to our city, to our community, and has done a lot of great work. Um, that you know goes without saying. I can't do much to help those cowboys um, at all, you know. But beyond that, um, I am proud to, and happy to, to have him part of our, our our city, and I'm proud to work with him. So, thank you, Doctor Chandler, for for all the work that you. I second that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else at this point? You know, if I, you know, if I could just you know make a comment, I was going to make a comment during our council comments in a bit, but. Uh, this past weekend, I was invited to, you know, go visit our friends in Norfolk to speak at the Ryan White uh, Foundation dinner. And this is a group that has been working for years on HIV and AIDS patients. And, you know, I was one of the speakers. And uh, when AIDS broke out in the early 1980s, I was working at North Beth Israel Medical Center in New Jersey. And it was a pretty much a death sentence back then. 
And there was a lot of fear. You know, a lot of people, even in the healthcare professions, were afraid of the contagiousness of it and the perceptions of it and everything like that. And I think a lot of the thing, and we had a remarkable um, physician talk about the progress that we have made over time. And I think if we look at our public health and you look at the complexities of public health and what has to be done to keep massive populations healthy over time, whether it be with COVID, whether it be HIV or influenza or any one of the number of things that are out there, you know, that is a remarkable challenge that public health officials have. Uh, it goes to quality of drinking water, it goes to lead pipes. I mean, you know, it's there's a lot of stuff out there you got to deal with. Um, but I was, uh, you know, hearkened by the fact that, you know, people like the Urban League, you know, partnered with Rivers, Riverside Medical Group and and they honor the people and the caretakers. And, you know, one of the gentlemen that spoke, uh, you know, has been carrying the uh, HIV and AIDS virus for, I think he said, 30 years. And, you know, but the thing is, you know, we're dealing with the problems. Will there be a, an occasional glitch that comes up or, you know, things of that nature. But when you look at the magnitude of the challenge that we have on so many fronts, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, Sabrina Wooten and Aaron bring up some very, very valid points that, you know, have to be addressed for a lot of reasons. But, but once again, I just wanted to personally thank you and, you know, all your colleagues from around, <clears throat> from what I understand, the foundation where I was at is a multi-city approach of which we're involved, correct? So, you know, good on you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Duhaney, I think we got a superstar coming. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, your legislative affairs director, Devin Bryant, is going to come and give council an update on the first initial drafting of your um, legislative packet for your further review and consideration. I'm going to provide you a snapshot of the requests that have been received so far from city departments, um, from some of you, and from some of your council appointed committees and commissions. And then I'm also going to give you a glimpse of what we expect to be introduced by the governor um, in his uh, governor led initiatives, and then items from last year that we expect will be reviewed. First, um, in order to formulate your legislative package, this is the timeline that I expect we're probably going to follow um, with your approval, of course. Um, many of the items that um, are, will be in the <coughs> reviewed in your Friday package, but I also received in the past day a few more requests that I'm going to mention to you. Um, you'll notice that uh, we have two months from today um, to refine the package so that it accurately uh, reflects um, your legislative agenda. Um, the schedule will give us enough time to secure patrons and educate our delegation on the items um, so that when you send me to Richmond in January, I can hit the ground running. Okay, so today we have our workshop. Um, in two weeks from today, we plan on another workshop, which in the meantime, we can start refining these items, and I expect that I'll probably be reaching out to each of you for items that you are interested in putting forward. Um, on our uh, 1018, we will have our formal session for public comment. And then post-elections, that's our first meeting post-election, that's on 11-15, um, where we'll adopt the legislative package. Okay, so here's the pre-filing schedule. Um, as a practical matter, once you adopt your legislative package with the projected date of November 15th, 
Um, there's an intervening Thanksgiving holiday there, so we'll have a short window to shop the bills to our delegates and have them put it into the Department of Legislative Services for drafting. Then we'll start seeing the bills drop uh, probably around December 1st and throughout December. Wednesday, January 11th starts the legislative session. It's an odd numbered year, so we only have a 45 day session this year. So hopefully we'll be all done and have it wrapped up by February 24th. <laughs> I'm laughing too. We're gonna try. Um, the Senate uh, Rules Committee met last week on Wednesday, September 7th, and they established their bill limits. Um, if you recall during COVID, we had much shorter or, or uh, less uh, bill, the, the bill limits were much smaller. Um, this year, for all practical uh, purposes, the senators will each have uh, be allowed 26 bills for introduction. And if you do the math on that times 40 senators, that's 1,040 Senate bills. The House Rules Committee hasn't established theirs yet. Um, but as you know, there's 100 House members. So if each of them are allotted 26 bills, that's another 2,600 bills for a total of somewhere around 3,640 bills. I don't expect that the House will probably um, have a 26 bill limit, but you never know. Um, the main takeaway here is that the bill limits can impact the availability of patrons that we have and their willingness to carry bills. As you recall, during COVID, when they had uh, like 15 bill limits, they would say, oh, I don't have any more room. So uh, this year, for better or for worse, we may have uh, plenty of room. Oops, sorry. Okay, um, we'll start with um, several of the requests <laughs> to amend the Constitution. Then we have the city charter and then the Virginia Code. So as you know, the right to marry for same-sex couples has been protected in Virginia since 2015 um, with the uh, Obergefell case. And the issue here, and this had come up two years in a row, and it will be coming back this year. Um, currently, the right to marry would not be protected in Virginia if the U.S. Supreme Court were to overturn that uh, Obergefell case, because um, our Virginia Constitution in Article 1, Section 15A um, states that it, uh, marriage is only between one man and one woman. So our Virginia Human Rights Commission would like to either change that, that wording to either two consenting adults or get rid of this code section altogether. They would like to see either a repeal or a change. The next one, we have one city charter amendment that was requested by Mr. Moss. Um, currently, when a vacancy occurs in the local governing body, the remaining members of the body or the board have 45 days to appoint a qualified voter to fill the vacancy. And the current process is what you used recently to appoint Council Member Miles, and not to you, Council Member Miles. Um, but if this were adopted, this process would no longer exist, and Section 3.03 of the Virginia Beach Charter would be amended, and all interim vacancies of city council members and the mayor uh, would be filled by special election. Um, next, we have requests to amend the Virginia Code. This is from last year, and it's going to be coming back this year. In 2023, this was initiated by Councilmember Tower and introduced in the House of Delegates by Delegate um, Angela Williams Graves. It was House Bill 980. Uh, the purpose of the amendment was to allow for the names, <coughs> telephone numbers, and email addresses to remain anonymous for people who reported housing code violations such as this. Um, right now, uh, residents who report zoning code violations can remain anonymous, but not those for nuisance. Um, the subcommittee uh, that was assigned this during the <coughs> session um, recommended that this bill be taken up by the FOIA Council. This ended up being the only bill that the FOIA Council did take up this year. Um, our housing code administrator, Wells Freed, and myself, and one of the code supervisors, RJ, uh, Matt is, we got together in July with Delegate Williams Grave and we went up to Richmond and we met with the subcommittee. Um, we had a lot of support from VML and VACO and VACO, their um, general counsel gave some really compelling testimony about this. What ended up happening is the subcommittee is looking to recommend adoption um, with several changes. They may pick and choose which ones they decide that we can keep um, private. Uh, they, their concern mainly is for abuse, and that people may make complaints that aren't warranted. Um, so this is going to have to be reintroduced by Delegate Williams Graves, and we'll see what the FOIA Council says. We're waiting for the full, full FOIA Council to meet. 
So this one doesn't even require a sponsor this year. It will just automatically come up. Okay, the next one has, is a code change that again was requested by council member Moss. Um, as you know, in 2022, the General Assembly exempted the full 1.5% of the state grocery tax, but they left intact the 1% local option. Um, this amendment would allow this, enable the city council to adopt an ordinance that would exempt food purchased for human consumption and also essential personal hygiene products um, from the local retail sales and use tax. So we know that the governor has already been working on this and several uh, delegates and senators have said they will be back with this next year. So this is definitely going to be on the forefront. Um, and the, the question is, VML has also taken a position on this, their position being that they don't oppose it um, and they're in, in support as long as the 1% is somehow um, were made whole. Uh, that's a policy decision. And in, in addition to that, this, the question here would be whether or not you want us to find someone to carry this as a bill or whether we want to make a policy statement and sign on to the governors. So that will remain to be seen. But for now, we will just take it as, as a code change. Okay, the next one um, is interesting. Uh, this item was requested by Parks and Rec. And the first one's a picture of our city-owned playground at 31st Street. A second one is Kids Cove at Mount Trashmore. Uh, we have a lot of beautiful um, parks and recreational equipment throughout the city, and it looks like fun and easy, but apparently there is a glitch in our procurement uh, process, not ours, the state's, that doesn't allow for cooperative procurement for um, both A and E, and then also for um, installation. This. Um, is apparently a problem, I'm told, because of the way the installation needs to be done, and I'm sure some of our professionals uh, out here can explain this uh, better, but basically what this would do would include playground installations um, in an option for a co-op procurement for the concept planning and assembly drawings, as well as purchase of materials, equipment, and then the installation and assembly. So bottom line is it would make the procurement process for all of these much more streamlined. Okay, um, this was requested by Economic Development. Um, that's a, uh, inside of a data center, and that is the next one there is our corporate landing park where we currently have, I'll call it two and a half data centers because point one is still under construction. Um, there was a, a state code provision that exempt, exempted from taxation any equipment that was leased or purchased for use in data centers. This has a sunset provision, and yes, the sunset provision is 12 years away. It's in 2035, so this doesn't sound like it's um, you know urgent. However, uh, economic development has spoken to several of the data centers, ones that they want to also lure here, and apparently this is important for them because they need to have certainty as far as whether or not they would like to locate in Virginia um, because the equipment is very expensive and when it reaches obsolescence, they want to make sure that this incentive is going to remain. Okay, the next one um, is another code change which would enable localities to impose a discretionary curfew. Apparently, uh, at this point, there's two schools of thought, of legal thought as to whether or not a, le a locality can impose a discretionary curfew, which is not related to age and also not related to a public emergency such as we had during COVID. Um, what this request would do would be to seek clarification in the law or to add a state law provision that would enable the localities to adopt an ordinance that would um, impose a discretionary curfew. Okay, this one was requested by our planning departments, permits and inspections. Um, current law requires that new employees that issue permits, whether it be a building permit or a, any, any kind of permit, um, must have at least three years of experience and undergo a certification process per our Virginia Construction Code. The Virginia Construction Code is only updated every three years, and apparently it was already updated in 2021, so we are off cycle, um, and the next one won't be done until 2024. Um, so what this request would do would have the General Assembly direct the overseeing agency, which is DHCD, Department of Housing and Community Development, to immediately suspend this requirement, even if temporarily. And what this would do, because this, these are very difficult positions to fill, and apparently they're even more difficult when you have to have these kind of requirements, 
Um, so what they would like is a temporary suspension of this requirement so they could widen the pool of potential candidates um, during this hiring crisis. Okay, these two are add-ons that I just received uh, today, so they were not in your Friday package. Um, but I am told that Council Members Rouse and Miles are familiar with these two items, um, and that likely if they move forward, you, you may be our sponsors. The first request would align statutory requirements for posting professional service solicitations to be the same as construction. And basically what that would do would be to get rid of the requirement that it be published in the newspaper or just be posted on the city's website. And then the second request would clarify the bond amounts for certain construction contracts. Um, which would remove one of the barriers to participation by SWAM businesses. Okay, and this next one, these four items I also just received um, today, and these were requested by the RAC, and so I still have to do a little more investigation on them, but I wanted to mention them to you so that you were all um, aware. I'm told that Council Members Branch, Tower, and Miles are familiar with these items. They all like to tell us who, who's... Um, who's on board, and likely, um, if any move forward, maybe our sponsors. So um, the first request is a repeat from last year, um, and it failed to gain a lot of traction. This is the one where they were concerned about um, businesses putting their wares out on the sidewalk in the right-of-way. Um, the reason it didn't get much traction is really because it was, um, they didn't want any increase in civil penalties or to take any civil penalty and make it a cr criminal matter. So we'll have to look at that one a little bit more deeply. Um, the second item you'll see on the next few slides, um, the cannabis-related concerns, and I have that listed as one of your policy statements, so I think that's aligned with something you may already want to do. Tax on vaping products, um, that is another one that what I'm assuming they're asking for there is enabling legislation for a local tax. In 2020, the General Assembly approved a statewide tax right. on, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a liquid nicotine or vape juice tax of 6.6% at the state level. And I'm assuming, again, not, I don't have to assume because Mr. Tower just confirmed that what they're asking for is a local tax, um, an excise tax on these products. And then the fourth one is self-explanatory. They would like some money for parking development within the resort area. So, Brian? I, I, I know you mentioned number two. Mm -hmm. um, I have... Um, had some folks reach out to me about those concerns because there's a little um, few blurred lines there and people want to know how to operate, especially in the city on how to, you know, to move forward. So I, I'm happy to sponsor that. Okay, they're in, uh, going to talk a little bit more about the cannabis-related concerns because, as you know, last year uh, it would have had to have been reenacted and it wasn't, so it's probably going to all come back this year. So. And I know you mentioned you, if any of us wanted to sponsor that, so I wanted to make sure you knew I'm, Thank you I'm supportive that. of that. Very good. Okay. Um, next, I just have a few policy statements. These aren't specific things, but basically uh, last week when we met, um, Mrs. Henley mentioned <coughs> we'd like to see the um, current state and regional resiliency items be supported in your legislative agenda. Basically, these are the main ones that have been, uh, have, have been regionally and um, uh, citywide that, that have been um, come up that, that are things that you might want to support. The one that I really want to um, call your attention to is the last one, which is the continued support of and the participation in Reggie, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas gas initiative. And I'm sure you've all heard about this. It's very controversial. Um, the last Thursday, 61 Virginia Democrats, which is more than a third of the General Assembly, signed on to a letter um, that was addressed to the state's Air Pollution Control Board, and they were opposing Governor Youngkin's proposed regulatory route to remove us from Reggie. Um, so, and that happened after August 31st, Travis Boyles, who is the Acting Secretary of Natural um, and Historic Resources, he outlined that the administration was going to take an administrative route to get us out of Reggie. As of right now, we're still in, but we're not um, distributing any of the money. I did want to just mention to you that so far, there's been two rounds of Reggie, and we are currently applied for the third round, but it's kind of been held up because of this. Uh, city did already receive $4.9 million of Reggie funds um, from the Community Flood Protection Fund. 
We received $3 million for the Elizabeth River Project. We received one point nine million for SeaTac. And currently, we have $6.7 million that's pending um, in round three for First Colonial Ocean Boulevard Project and $1.7 million for Marsh Terrace. Uh, one point seven for First Colonial, five million for Marsh Terrace. Excuse me. Um, so even though these awards were supposed to be made in May, they're all just kind of backed up, and nothing's been given out based on the outcome of Reggie. So you may, whatever position you may want to take, that would be a good one. Mr. Moss, can I get a copy of uh, the JLA study and also the HRSD climate resilience study, please? Absolutely. Thank you. I can send Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone who needs more reading material. OK, great. Okay. Um, we have one more, another policy statement that was uh, requested by the Virginia Beach Human Rights Commission. Um, as you know, um, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade on June 24th, 2022, and they held that there was no longer a federal constitutional right to an abortion and the commission would like the current Virginia law to remain unchanged. And we know that will also be coming under attack and will be uh, requested change. So that was uh, their request. Um, here is the policy statement that I had brought up um, even prior to the RAC bringing it up. Uh, a couple of years, a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, I sent you all uh, a cannabis-related information, and it was a result of Norfolk um, putting forth some preemptive kind of uh, parameters. Uh, it's really kind of too soon to do anything because nothing is going on, but uh, we do know that there's going to be bills that are going to be reintroduced this year. Um, the main ones, I would say, would be the local option referendum if localities wanted to opt out, an expanded taxation for localities that we just talked about, um, you know, a little bit for, for cannabis and uh, just like the vaping and all of those. Um, liberal local ordinance and zoning authority, uh, VML and VACO are both pushing for the ability to have as much local authority as we can on the placement of where the dispensaries will be, the placement in, in you know, uh, proximity to schools and things like that. And then we also want a statutory role for localities in the licensing process. Uh, say we want, these are things that were already put forward. You have to uh, decide what it is that you would like for us to do. As you know, there's already cannabis control authority uh, in several different committees that have been formed. It is in an in absolute state of flux. So the best thing would be to come up with what your policies are and then we can work it from there. And as individual bills come up, I can bring them forward to you and we can decide. Trevor, uh, can I ask you what expertise we have, if any, uh, on staff in terms of cannabis regulation? Is anybody in uh, the city attorney's office ahead of this uh, in terms? I, I really, I mean, I think it, I think people in the resort area, the businesses that I've talked to, would like to have, to be um, at the table and have, <coughs> they've got some specific issues, but they just generally kind of want to be advised as well. I think one of the issues is they're not sure who to turn to for expertise. And I'm just seeking that within the, is there, within the city structure. Um, on as far as the city attorney's office, I'll, I'll leave that to Mark. Okay. But I do believe that Bobby Tahan and our planning department, I know I've spoken to them many times, and they do have a handle on what was proposed. And as a right. result, there's nothing we can do, but if we were to. Are, and are, are, are they part of it? I mean, are you following it with Bobby and the city attorney's office or that, that kind of who in, within the city is following this legislation? I speak for myself, I'm following it. But right. uh, quite honestly, at this point, there's, it, there's nothing much to follow right now uh, because it is just at kind of a st uh, stopping point until it's reestablished next year. So uh, I'm looking for a little more proactive reaction to see, knowing knowing that we're probably going to have it. I realize that the law got wiped out and got, we're kind of starting again. But um, I'm, in particular, I'm concerned because of our resort area. It's, it's a very sensitive area of the city. Lots of visitors with lots of different ideas about uh, consumption of cannabis products, I'm sure, from different 
coming from different backgrounds, it's new. So it's a it's a critical piece, I think, for the resort area. And I just want to make sure the city is fully engaged in this process and not totally reactive. I understand there's no law. Okay, so what do we do? We have to wait till they tell us what the law is. But I think having folks following it and being active in trying to come up with good laws, including cooperation with other areas in the state that may have to be similarly situated, although we know there's no place quite like Virginia Beach. There may be some places that are similar and have similar concerns. I just um, ha have a concern that we don't, uh, I think the RAC folks are concerned, and I'm speaking more for them, is that the city um, try to try to kind of meet this. It's a complicated problem, in it, and I do think Mr. Tahan's area is the real critical piece of it in terms of how we're going to, where we're going to allow sales and consumption and various things like that. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any direct expertise that I know of right now. I'm just seeking to know whether we have any or can get any. Okay, who's up? You, uh, John and then Michael and then Sabrina. My question is our expertise on taxation. <clears throat> Look at the Colorado, the California, the Oregon, the Washington State experience. They've taxation and retail establishment created a, a market that never existed before, which was the black market. And they neither have they realized the revenues they thought they would realize. Now they have a law enforcement problem they never had before. And has its own cost on localities trying to police all that. Okay. And, God, God. One and time. that is, you know, I like the local option for localities to opt out, but borders are pretty permeable, so that has its own issues. So it's like, uh, unless you have a big ocean, it's hard to have a continental policy. But I, I am concerned as we develop a policy and that is that we really are, and our, our legislators too should be concerned, is the, the taxation issue uh, can undermine everything you hope to achieve. And, and the real world is showing that to be the case. So I, I just have my doubts as to that you can think that this is, we're gonna get lots of revenue and then not have lots of costs and then the revenues don't, don't appear. And that has been the area where it has happened. So I just a word of caution. Okay, thank you, Michael and Sabrina. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think this is an opportunity maybe more just take a moment to talk about the issue, which I think is what's happening now, than necessarily legislation that's related to the issue. Um, we've uh, had a chance to talk about this. I know I had a meeting with our economic development team about more than a year ago. We explored some of the implications for this upcoming legislation and what that would look like for zoning and some other things. And they were very responsive to it, and they did a great job. And I'm great, very much appreciative of that. But I think what this discussion reveals is the necessity to continue that proactive discussion about whatever the legislation ends up with, what will be the impact for our city? I've seen it done very well in, in a planned way that distributes opportunity equally and preserves safety and promotes economic and, um, and, health and, um, and physical well-being. And then I've seen it done where it looks like the Wild West. Um, and it's very detrimental to our neighborhoods and to our community. Even recently, I would point to a scenario that I had in my district with a, people who were illegally, apparently illegally, um, distributing cannabis. But they didn't, may, may not have known that. So um, I think we do need a lot of proactive, um, not just from your office, Ms. Bryan, certainly making sure we're on top of the legislation and stating what, 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 you know, what we want will be best for our city, but also as an administration to be proactive about um, preparing for whatever the eventuality will be. I know I read an article that Norfolk um, is, is, is in the process of that planning now, so we may want to reach out to them and find out what their planning department is looking at. But I know that they're, they're, they are uh, making those sort of proactive as far as I can tell, decisions about what they'd like to see for their community. And I think we need to get on the same page about 
what we'd like to see and then pursue it so that we can optimize all the opportunity that comes with cannabis and minimize the, um, the detrimental impacts. So I, I, I think we do need to be more proactive in that regard. Thank you, Michael. Sabrina. Thank you. Um, and, you know, this, I think it's a pertinent time to talk about this issue because whether we like it or not, it's here. I mean, just about everywhere you go, people are talking about it, they're engaged in it. And so certainly being proactive is the way we want to go. And I would even offer really having some key stakeholders become a part of whatever we decide to do, a part of that process. We need their input. We need to know um, um, the do's and don'ts, as was mentioned, but we really need to make sure we work with some key stakeholders in, in planning this and moving forward. Um, but I would also like to get some information with, as it stands now, how, how, how do folks operate um, uh, with you know, cannabis? What, how do things operate in our city so that folks are not doing things that are illegal? You know, because there are questions out there um, and, and they, they really don't know, most folks really don't know how to operate and what to do, how many ounces, how many, so those types of things, and that may be for the staff. <laughs> and, and also, I'd also like to say the police department has done a great job of really getting out in front and saying, you know, things like, here's what here's what we do, here's some information, you can go here, you know, and so we, those are things we can continue to do to make sure folks are aware, um, because um, I don't think everyone is aware of how we're operating, um, and especially as we're in limbo waiting to see what the state is going to do. It's going to be helpful, um, I'm sure, and keep a lot of folks out of trouble, um, but most importantly, to help people operate in, in, the right, um, in the right manner in our city. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm trying to get clarity on where council wants to go with this. Is it is council asking for um, <coughs> a briefing or an update on information as it relates to the enforcement of the individual use, or how do we of smoking marijuana, or is it um, the hypothetical scenario when the state possibly comes up with whatever the state comes up with of how we would allow for the distribution and sale of cannabis and where did you have geographically be located within the city of Virginia Beach or is it both? Oh. I think my, my focus would be on the latter. Guy? Yeah, I, I think it's both, but with I agree with Michael with the emphasis on the latter. I think this, uh, I don't want my comments uh, about the RAC to be misconstrued. This is an area that affects the whole city and um, the RAC doesn't speak for the city, and it knows quite well that it doesn't. But yet it's got an active committee that really wants to be, thinks we need to be involved, if for no other reason than the resort area. But I suspect there are a lot of citizens that would be interested in having a committee that's on top of it. What are other cities doing, and what are other areas? How can they affect it? Not all related to the legislative but but realizing that it's coming, there's going to be some legislation. You can make some reasonable predictions that uh, of, of what we're going to have. And rather than wait for the state to act and then say, okay, now let's put together a task force and decide how we're going to deal with that, I just think there's a feeling among a number of people that it might be good to have some kind of task force in place. Think about who ought to be on it, what areas of the the civic leagues, the staffing, staff level, to just be given some more thought to it than, than we have today. Okay, anybody else at this point? <coughs> okay. All right. I'm sure there's more. A little bit more continuing on um, affordable housing. Um, this is definitely going to be uh, coming back or coming to fruition in 2023, addressing affordable um, housing you may wish to weigh in on some policy statements um, and of the trends that we've been seeing. I, I just wrote a few down here that not wanting to erode our local planning and zoning authority, there is some um, 
talk in Richmond that that is the way that they want to go, feeling that um, one of the barriers to affordable housing is our individual zoning laws. And uh, our zoning department, for one, doesn't feel that that's the barrier. Um, it's, it's much bigger than, than that. So making every, uh, you know, coming in, having Richmond come in and change all of our zoning laws on top of us isn't really uh, what they feel is the way to go. The one thing I did want to mention, I've been sitting in on a lot of um, affordable housing workshops lately, and one, the, cre the last one, the creation of a statewide <laughs> portal to attract and assist developers of residential affordable housing. Apparently, our um, economic development has something like this at the state level, and some of the talk has been that many developers around the state, especially those that want to be affordable housing, just don't know where there's availability of space and what kind of incentives any locality would be willing to give. So they want to, it would be a voluntary portal that the state would set up, su such as like an economic development type thing in um, opportunity zones, where you could say, here is a plot of land that the city would like redevelop, sort of an RFP type thing and here's the incentives that we'll give you to uh, this is what we want kind of thing so um, that is something that's definitely being uh, brought to um, light at the state and probably will be will be happening so that's something we might want to think about and then in, in addition any other um, I'm assuming there's definitely going to be bills and things that come up on affordable housing and I will of course bring all of those um, to your attention and I know um, Councilmember Miles has been a big proponent of, of affordable housing and, and John, John and then the, the alternator. Go right ahead, because that's the end. Yeah, go back that slide if you could. Yeah. You know, I've, I'm sure all of you have been talking to local legislators, too, and they have to run in November of 23, so no one's looking for bold policy initiatives to come out of the General Assembly in this session. So it gets back to, do you really think there's any traction that's going to be that enabling legislation is going to be making out of a divided General Assembly in 2022, in the 2023 Assembly. Uh, I, I probably think there's a number of these things when you look at the calculus and the political chemistry that they're, they might be talked about, but very little is going to see light of day. So you may not, we may not want to expend powder on something that the bullet's never going to leave the chamber. Which is why I said maybe just policy statements, because that's what um, many of our sister cities are doing. Um, I've spoken to you know Chesapeake, Norfolk, Newport News, and Hampton. We all kind of discuss these things, and they're all coming up with just basic policy statements on what they'd like to see, especially since, as you just mentioned, nothing, there, there's not going to be much controversial things happening. So uh, it, it may be something that we carry for two years. Okay, and then uh, Dulcino, and then Sabrina. In those policy statements, is there anything addressing best practices for funding, public funding, to provide either either we uh, bank land or something like that we, <coughs> as part of our overall strategy to um, provide these options? You can certainly add something like that. So without you know, necessarily, as Mr. Moss was saying, without committing to it, but at the same time, at least put it on the table and then post-election, maybe get more traction. Right. And of course, we will have um, you know another budget to look at. So, right. funding opportunities in the budget. I didn't even touch on the budget part yet. Right. Okay, I do certainly like what you mentioned in terms of looking at what our sister cities are doing. I think we definitely um, need to do whatever we can to promote affordable housing. Happy to be supportive um, of this legislation as well, um, as we do certainly need. Um, definitely a change there. Um, we need some champions on that on that item. Um, but also, I'm going to go back to the legislation about um, the curfews. Can, can I have more information on that? I'm just wondering what that's going to entail. I see the picture here. It looks like a picture of protesting. And I, I, I just want to make sure you know, I get some clarity on where that's going. So what type I, of impact that will have? I need some more information there. And, and I really think that the city attorney um, can probably give you more about the nuance of the curfew. But as of right now, it's not really clear as to whether or not we can do something proactively. So, I mean, this this is 
can't mind my pictures. This is actually a picture of in Virginia Beach when there was some tear gas that had to be. In this kind of a situation where there is an, an imminent emergency like this, then there can be a curfew called, from my understanding. Um, but yet, this is a proactive type thing where there's no situation that exists right now, but we are expecting there might be. I think that's really just the, the difference of what we're not clear as to whether or not we have the authority to do. Mm -hmm. So I want to be clear on it. So I, I do want some more information to, to be clear on what we are trying to do and how that's going to impact. Um, perhaps it is something, perhaps it is protesting. Perhaps I, don't, I don't know, but I do want to be clear. If I'm asked questions from the community, Ms. Wooten, what does that mean? And also to clarify, sorry, Mr. Mayor, sure. also to clarify, these are requests from the sheriff's office and the um, I know. And the police department as well. So none of these are in your packet until the council says they're in your packet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, say, I'll say this from the concern that the police department and sheriff's office has is that currently right now, the only way that you can call a curfew outside of if a nuclear attack happened on Virginia Beach was if the governor's office called the curfew, right? There's, mm -hmm. there, there are times when the police department and sheriff's office feels that it may be necessary or it may make sense for the local government to have that authority beyond beyond just a nuclear attack that they like to be able to have that discretion for. But I think you're probably, you're right. We probably should have them come and provide more information and details about when that makes sense. Please. Okay, Rosemary and John. Uh, going back to the affordable housing, uh, you know, a lot of states have a housing <clears throat> fund they help with affordable housing. So maybe could add something funding for it. And then a lot of times we ask for funding for, for special projects here in our city. I don't know, we might want to put some thought into what we might want to ask. For example, maybe we want a parking garage at Rudy Loop. Or, you know, there's a lot of other ideas that could pop up, but um, what are we thinking about some funding projects to, to ask for our delegation. The aquarium wouldn't be a bad one either. <laughs> okay, John. I want to come back to Sabrina's point. You know, we I think we always need to understand why local governments don't have authority and understand how that history came about. I think we've always been suspicious of skeptics of government being able to curfew the exercise of people's liberties. And certainly, if we have something that shouldn't be being exercised by a constitutional officer, it should only be being exercised by someone who's responsible and accountable to the council through the city manager. And at what point and how many hours or minutes after which it requires the council to convene or to continue? Because I think people are, and rightfully so in America, skeptical of granting people the authority that restricts people's liberty for any extended period of time without legislative or judicial due process. So I, I think that needs a lot of careful consideration in the parameters, but I understand why in an incident, you gotta let an incident commander act in the moment, but the moment should be short lived and be well prescribed and people's liberty should not be unduly duly constrained until the legislative body says it's necessary. So that's just a, my thought on it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, hey, anybody else at this point would acquire? <clears throat> Deb, thank you for your great work as usual. In two weeks. Sure, be back. Okay, any uh, council discussions or initiatives? Okay, Barbara. Um, last week when we were talking about the um, issue of our next steps for achieving that sustainability goal of clean, healthy, beautiful waterways, you had a list of next steps, and one of those was a you know community outreach and encouraging neighborhoods and community groups to host a fall cleanup event in October of 2022, and really talking about this whole bit of involving people uh, voluntarily in uh, learning how to uh, uh, make certain that we dispose of uh, waste in the right fashion. I asked the staff to put together a resolution uh, which would accomplish this, and uh, this has got my name on it simply because I asked them to to do that. But I would like to pass this around, and and if this is something that you folks are interested in, in perhaps uh, having on our agenda next week, 
Um, I would like to have this, you know, by the city council, but it's a resolution which simply uh, does what these next steps do, and I think helps us get out the word about how we can um, uh, address these litter issues in a very uh, uh, voluntary fashion and, and cooperative fashion. One thing that uh, in the putting together the information that we had asked for last week, the fact that we have these special volunteer days, I would just mention that next week, Saturday, September 24th, is International Coastal Cleanup Day, which is sponsored by Keep Virginia Beach Beautiful. So we have these things ongoing, and I think helping to uh, educate our, our people to just where all the opportunities are is important. And um, if you all are, are interested in, in this, I would ask for your, uh, your comments so we know whether to put it on the agenda next week and whether or not uh, this is something you would all like to be a part of. Well, we're going to do it in October. This is mm -hmm. Next week's the last meeting in September. Right. Uh -huh. so. You need to move on this. Right. Uh -huh. You can put my name on it. Okay. Yeah. okay. So All right. Put it on it. Okay. Everybody want to be a part. So this will be a resolution requested by the city council, and we won't have to put everybody's name on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And okay. Any, forward to that. Anybody else? Yeah, John. Just an update on noise, the noise ordinance. Uh, we have sent out the first letter that went out to everyone who spoke. And we're sending out a second letter to state all the stakeholders. I took your comments under advisement, so we're going out to all these different organizations, Vision Rack, you name it, Toyota, we're sending them a letter as well. And then based upon that, we haven't yet set there will be a morning and an evening meeting. Those cases <coughs> haven't yet been set. We've also gathered the ordinances from New Orleans. You may recall that was one of the ones that was mentioned. Have we taken a look at what New Orleans has done with, and I've read those are quite quite lengthy, much longer than ours, and has some good things. That, and I also looked at the one for Boston, because Boston also has a performance aspect in their community and their subways and whatnot. So we have, and we have shared those with people as well. We will keep you informed, but we are, continuing to march out smartly and we do appreciate the help of the staff nancy has been really outstanding so part of the uh, genesis of this noise ordinance was the busker situation at the oceanfront and we were looking at this conservancy idea where are we on that i could check in to see where we are with that one okay. you update. thank you hey, anybody else at this point Okay, let's uh, get into close here. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the uh, exemptions from the open meeting allowed by section 2.23711A Code of Virginia as amended for the following purposes. Personnel matters, discussions, considerations, or interviews of prospective candidates, employment, assignment, appointment, promotion. Performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resigning from specific public officers, appointees, or employee, uh, employees of public bodies pursuant to section 2.237.11a1. And that would be regarding council appointments, board, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Yeah, motion and a second. Councilmember Berlucci? Aye. Councilmember Brandt? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Miles? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Rouse? Aye. Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. And Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of 11 to 0, recess into closed session. Okay, let's uh, take five minutes. Councilmember Berlucci? Aye. Councilmember Brand? Aye. Councilmember Henry? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Miles? Aye.
Councilmember Moss. Aye. Councilmember Rouse. Aye. Councilmember Tower. Aye. Councilmember Wooten. Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson. Aye. Mayor Dyer. Aye. By a vote 11 to 0, you certify the postal. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.